way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Hey, we got some great guests today. First of all, Anthony Redgrave is going to be here in just a little bit from the DNA Doe Project. And he's been the team leader with this group that a few years ago was able to identify a murder victim. The shocking part about this was that the murder took place in 1916. Yeah, you're going to want to hear how they solved it and the story of the man whose remains were found in Idaho years ago. And then after that, Robert Cushing's going to be here from Legacy Tree Genealogist. He's going to share some knowledge about Southern research. So anybody who's got some Southern ancestors is going to want to listen to what Robert has to say because obviously researching the South Kind of troubling because so many of those courthouses burn. So we'll hear what he has to say. Hey, let's bring in David Allen Lambert, our chief genealogist from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. David, welcome back. Thank you very much. And I just want to tell you that my ancestor in the Civil War did not burn out any courthouses. That's that I know of. good to know. <laughs> yes, some of them did that and they weren't doing it under orders. They just were mad. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, rage going on during the war. Of course, probably happened in a lot of wars, but uh, I'm doing great. No rage, not burning any courthouses <laughs> down this week. So I'm actually building things, though. I, we just built and launched our brand new website for ExtremeGenes.com. And uh, I'm very excited about it. And one, one person described it as having a new car smell. I liked that. <laughs> I think you don't hear that about websites too often. And hey, if uh, you develop the smell vision for the internet, <laughs> we're going to retire. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're uh, offering a free genealogical strategy roadmaps and a free DNA starter guide and some courses as well. Because, you know, after eight years, I figured it's about time maybe we help some people along in understanding what DNA can do and just how to do the basics of genealogy. So check out our new website, our new ExtremeGenes.com. I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's great, and congratulations. Thank you, sir. Let me tell you, though, something that came up this week that just blew my mind, and this might fill the rest of our time here in this first segment. On mm -hmm. eBay the other day, and you play there all the time, eBay. as yes, I yes, do, yes. there was a letter that I came across that was written in 1862 by a guy named Reuben Hitchcock in Connecticut. And it's uh, addressed to Mr. Alfred Andrews, dated from uh, Cheshire, Connecticut, December 27th, 1862. And he said, by your request, I take the opportunity of answering your letter, which I received yesterday. I'll give you the date of my marriage, which was January 1st, 1832. The name of my parents were Asa and Asenath Hitchcock. The date of my birth is June 17th, 1794. The names of my children, and then he goes through them, and two of the three had passed away. And the date of my wife, Rhoda's death, was June 15th, 1846. Respectfully yours, Reuben Hitchcock. And the envelope that it came in was part of it on eBay, all of 13 bucks. 13 wow, bucks. Wow, is it a relative? Not to me, no, no, oh. huh, not at all. But I looked okay. at it, I was just looking at some handwritten items from the 19th century, and you know, you and I both advocate for looking for things on eBay all the time mm -hmm. that might exactly. relate to the family. I'm looking at that and going, boy, I'd like to find some way to relate it to my family because that's a treasure. And, it really uh, is. So I wound up going over to Family Search first and saw that uh, only the volunteers had put anything about this couple on the family tree. It didn't appear there were any descendants who had been part of putting up that information. So I went over to Ancestry and found only one tree actually had this couple on there. So I dropped a, a message through Ancestry messaging to this person and said, hey, you're not going to believe what's on eBay. And by the morning, she had that thing bought. And she was so tickled and excited about having it. So I kind of dove into what exactly was going on there, because why would somebody write such a letter in the middle of the Civil War? And this is what it said. I have a huge collection of letters I'll be listing from the 19th century 
written wow. by and to the Hart and Andrews families tracking genealogy back to the early 18th century. And apparently this was used for a book called A Genealogical History of Deacon Stephen Hart and His Descendants, 1632 to 1875. David, when I went back to see what this guy was selling, he has dozens of these things, if not more. Wow, and that's it, a shame that they're not in a library someplace. <laughs> well, yes, and apparently they were at some point with a oh. historical society that put them up for consignment. So I don't know what that was about or why, but, you know, it really does illustrate that you really need to keep your eye on eBay for things that might relate to your family because what a treasure that is. It's really kind of like inheriting a family Bible page. It really is, and I would love to come across something like that. So you keep on searching eBay auctions and <laughs> tell me if you find any of my family, okay? Well, That's I, great. It's interesting because included with this was the original envelope that the guy enclosed this letter in, and it says as the return address from Reuben Hitchcock of Southington married Rhoda Hamblin, their family. And then it's addressed to the guy who eventually put together this book on these descendants. So I looked at many others. None of them relate to my family, but I would suggest to anybody who wants to get an idea of what you might be able to find on eBay to go in there and check out these handwritten letters and uh, perhaps put in the keywords heart and Andrews and handwritten. And that might help you find that. It's an amazing thing. And I wish you the best of luck. Hey, that's great. And I, I'm sure the person that you connected back with their ancestor's letter truly appreciates. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And she still lives in Connecticut, too, where these people were from. Wow. Thank you very much for allowing me to hear that exciting story. I'm going to have to go to eBay now and start searching for ancestors stuff until 2 a.m. Yeah. And if you want to see a place that's been collecting things since 1845, American Ancestors welcomes you to come in and become a member. And you can use a code EXTREME when you check out on AmericanAncestors.org and save $20. All right, David. Thank you so much. We'll see you at the back end of the show for Ask Us Anything. And coming up next, the story of a murder victim identified only a few years ago after his death in 1916. Hear how it was done with the DNA Doe Project coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies. Our sponsors at Ancestry have big news. They've completely redesigned the Ancestry mobile app. Now more than ever, the Ancestry app is your Genie travel companion. Check out their new photo line feature where your photos are turned into an amazing collage you can share on social media. Under Discover, check out your daily pics that shows you the most relevant hints to your research and stories and photos that may be on other people's family trees. You can also click on Pick Up Where You Left Off to see the last person you are working on. And all of this works in sync with your desktop at home. And in sync with newspapers.com, find out what happened on this day in history. And if you want to know what happened on a given day in your family history, use the new widget Events in Your Family Tree tree that gives you ancestral birth dates, death anniversaries, and wedding anniversaries. Plus, check out the Maps feature that ties to your family history. Download the new Ancestry mobile app today. Hey, Genies, it's Fisher here, and my shiny new ExtremeGenes.com website has been described as having that new car smell. I love hearing that. Having been with you for over eight years now, it felt like time to help out listeners and followers who need to know the basics of genealogical research, as well as how to understand your DNA test results and to be able to put them to work for you breaking down brick walls, identifying birth parents, locating new cousins who may have photos and information that can't be found anywhere else, and verifying your paper trails. Yes, DNA can do all that, and I can show you how. Check out the all-new ExtremeGenes.com website and download the free Genealogy Strategy Roadmap and the free DNA Starter Guide. Then, if you like what you see, you can take those next steps to sign up for the video courses that you can watch at your leisure. I'll take you through all the basics, step-by-step. Step. Find out more now at ExtremeGenes.com. 
At Legacy Tree Genealogists, we provide families like yours with the stories of your ancestors, a legacy that will be cherished for generations to come. Legacy Tree Genealogists provides genealogy research for clients worldwide, helping them discover their roots and personal history through records, narratives, and DNA analysis. And when your research requires access to on-site archives in the countries your ancestors lived, Legacy Tree Genealogists has researchers in more than 100 countries around the globe who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Legacy Tree Genealogists is the recommended research firm of genealogy industry leaders worldwide, including MyHeritage, 23andMe, and more. Check out what our clients have to say. Absolutely the best. They communicated through the entire process and my report arrived on time. The story of my family with supporting documents was very fulfilling. Tom G. Google Review. Don't wait any longer. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Hey, we are back at it on Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. And uh, one of the amazing stories came about with the discovery of a corpse in a cave in Idaho. And my next guest was able to actually figure out who he was and when he got there. And it's an amazing story. Anthony Redgrave's on the line with me right now from RedgraveResearch.com. Anthony, how are you? Welcome to Extreme Genes. Hi. This is quite a story. I mean, we're talking oh, going yeah. back 104 years at this point, and using genetic genealogy, we're able to put this whole thing together. First of all, give us a little background. How did you get involved? And then tell us a little about how the body was found. Sure. I'm a team lead and case manager for the DNA Doe Project, which is a nonprofit organization that has been around since February of 2017. So, I've been working on cases through them for quite some time. My wife and I, who also is the co-team lead of, of the case and also works with me on the DNA Doe Project, we made friends with a biological anthropologist who lectures at the University of New Hampshire. She had previously been employed by Idaho State University, and that's how she had learned about this case. The remains had been housed there since 1991. And the students had been using it to learn on. And law enforcement kept the case open, and they had consulted with her about getting a new analysis done of the remains. And they really were continuing to try to identify this man. Wow. And she found out about what we were doing and was very interested because nobody had ever tried that before with him. And she wanted to give him the best chance of being identified. They tried everything else. They tried the FBI, the Smithsonian Institute. Everybody had had a crack at it. So she got in touch with the Clark County Sheriff's Office and got their permission to submit the case to the DNA Doe Project to be worked. And then the DNA Doe Project helped them through the lab process because with unidentified remains, you can't just ask them to spit in a tube and mail it to ancestry. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually a very complicated lab process right. that goes into that. Sure. Did they have any idea how old this thing was? Here's, here's the kicker. The anthropologist at the Smithsonian Institute, Dr. Douglas Ubelacker, he was very hesitant to give any sort of post-mortem interval because he'd seen cases in which remains that were in this condition before were 100 years old. A postmortem interval is the time in between when remains are found and when the person actually died. So mm -hmm. how long it had been sitting there. This man in this cave, he was dismembered, but his remains were in a condition called adipose here or grave wax. And that means that he was basically mummified. Wow. Mummified yeah. in a cave in Idaho. Yeah, the, the conditions are perfect. I went there when we went for the press conference, and it stays a cool 55 degrees, and it's really dry all year round. Okay. It was like 17 degrees outside of the cave, and it was really comfy in there. <laughs> so I understand how it happened. But sure. So Douglas Uberlacher, he was asked to give this postmortem interval, and he was very uncomfortable doing it, and he very reluctantly said five months to five years. And based on the fact that it was giving off a smell, there was still a lot of soft tissue. But he had seen cases where remains had looked like that and were Civil War soldiers. Oh, wow. That's unbelievable. So, you mentioned it was at the university in 1991. But at what point did they actually find these remains? The first time the remains were found was in 1979. A family that was doing some artifact hunting in, in one of the smaller lava tubes off the main one 
they found the torso first buried in a, a shallow ditch. The soil there is really silty. It's um, volcanic ash, basically. Okay. And it's entirely possible that he was buried deeper and just came up from erosion. But they found his torso in 1979 wrapped in a burlap sack. And then again in 1991, another family doing the same thing found his limbs. They still haven't found his head. There was a very extensive archaeological excavation done to try to locate any trace of the skull or anything. And Mm -hmm. they brought cadaver dogs in and nothing. That's crazy. So you got started on this. You got his DNA and then you went to work. How long did it take you? Now, you said you had a team. How many people are on your team? We had a team of about 14 people and it took us about three and a half months. All volunteers? Yes. Wow. That is amazing. And so you all worked on this thing together. As you got the kit up to compare to other people's DNA test results, just people like you and I who send in our spit, what did you find that helped you to identify this individual? What we found was that there were a great many DNA matches who were fairly close cousins. The top matches were somewhere between the first and third cousin range. So we thought, oh, this is a gold mine. We'll have this solved by the end of the night. I think I stayed up for about two days straight, wondering why I hadn't solved it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> and, there, was a gen- there was a generational difference at this point that you weren't yes, aware yes. of, right? Mm-hmm. At this point, I wasn't aware of that. And it was also unlike anything that we'd ever seen before. We noticed that a lot of these genetic cousins were linking into the Loveless family. Now, what was throwing me off here was that there was someone with a really substantial match on the X chromosome. So I was thinking the Loveless family was on the maternal side. But given that all of these relations were three times removed, given the age, and I didn't know that at the time, I had one of our other volunteer genealogists who's far more experienced with Y-DNA come in and tell me, no, his Y-haplogroup is pointing to Loveless. So that's actually the paternal side. Oh, wow. And that's when we started figuring out that there were so many removals. It was very interesting to see how that played out. Usually when we make an ID, we get people who are not that far removed because when you're working on your own DNA, you usually find somebody who's maybe one time removed or two times removed. At the most. This was three. This was the, the, three. The closest we had was three times removed, yeah. Wow. And also, here's another fun fact. So he's descended from pioneers, and he comes from a family that is full of half relationships because his grandfather had four wives and somewhere around 14 children, and those children all had at least 10 children each. There were a lot of people to look through. We ended up with three or four different possible candidates for his identification, and it was just a matter of figuring out which one ended up in the cave. But it taught us that working with the DNA of descendants of pioneers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that there's not only endogamy because of the small population, religious communities and isolated communities, but there's also a lot of half relationships because of the polygamy. Yeah. So on one (laughs) hand, we have something that's making people look like they're sharing higher, but on the other hand, we have something that's making people look like they're sharing lower. Yes, complicated, isn't it? So it wasn't as predictable as usual. Well, tell us about the guy. What was his name? What was he doing in the cave? When did he get there? His name was Joseph Henry Loveless. He was born in 1870 in Payson, Utah. He was born in the church. He was baptized. We have his baptismal record. Then things went kind of south, and I don't know exactly when this happened, but he has a very long criminal record of bootlegging and counterfeiting and robbery and escaping jail. He escaped jail by sawing through the bars using a saw he hid in his shoes more than once, so he was planning for this. (laughs) Wow. He would also hop trains and somehow stop them to escape them. Oh, wow. This is a crazy man. Absolutely. Something like a movie cowboy, except he's real. Yeah, yeah. And finally, what happened probably right before he died, given the clues that we have, he murdered his wife with an axe. Oh. Now, here's the interesting part. Nobody previously had fully connected him to this murder because he was using an alias. Ah, okay. He had multiple aliases at least four, and the murder was attributed to one of his aliases. The thing that made us know that these were the same person was some very, very extensive research, mostly through newspapers, because he didn't have a legal paper trail. He was living in a tent on the outskirts of town. 
So we didn't have any sort of alibi for where he was at the time of the crime. Under his alias was claiming that his wife's former husband did it, but he actually met himself. The former husband of his wife was actually living in another state with another family. Okay. So this is very historical CSI stuff sure. that we're doing here. <laughs> um, but the real kicker was that when he was arrested for this and escaped, a wanted poster was published under the name Walt Karens, which was the, the alias he was using at the time and the alias he was arrested under. And it had a physical description of him that described the clothing he was wearing. The clothing he was wearing when he escaped jail are the same clothes that the body in the cave was found wearing, whose DNA is unmistakably tied to Joseph Henry Lovelace. Oh, wow. Therefore, Walt Karens and Joseph Henry Lovelace are the same person. Same person. Wow. Yeah. And who do, who do you think did this? Who killed him? You don't cut we your own head no off. no idea. No, you don't cut your own head off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet. It, it's still an open investigation. There's no statute of limitations on murder. The sheriff's office is actually still actively investigating it. There's a possibility that it was a family member of the wife who was seeking revenge. It's possible that it could be another criminal that he was involved in who wanted his money or for some other reason. So there's, there's a couple of possibilities there, but the investigation is actually still open. And I, I, for one, will be excited to find out what exactly went down after that, because we're, we're still learning a lot from this case. He's Anthony Redgrave from RedgraveResearch.com and the DNA Doe Project. He and his team have identified a victim of a murder from 1916. And uh, Anthony, this is really strong work. Congratulations. Thank you. You've made a lot of news over the last uh, couple of weeks, and I it's it's great sure to get the, the full story here. Mm-hmm. Glad to share it. Do you have a bunch more cases you're working on now? Oh, yeah. There's several more coming down the road for me. All right, Anthony. Um, well, great talking to you. Thanks so much for coming on the show, mm-hmm. and we look forward to hearing some more headlines out of your group. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thanks, you too. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Robert Cushing. He is with Legacy Tree Genealogist, one of our great sponsors. He's going to talk about Southern research. And if you have Southern ancestors, you know it can be really, really challenging. So he'll give you some idea of what records might be out there, which records have been lost. A lot to talk about coming up next when we return in five minutes on Extreme Genes. So many people have so many connections to family down south. Hey, it's Fisher here, and I'm talking to Robert Cushing. He's with Legacy Tree Genealogist. He's a DNA specialist there, but he's located in Athens, Georgia. And I thought that maybe today we'd talk to him a little about Southern research, because let's face it, so many people go back to the Civil War. And that uh, central conflagration in the history of our country uh, obviously caused a lot of people to scatter. We lost a lot of people, and we lost a lot of records, too, didn't we, Robert? Uh, We definitely did. Well, it's great to have you on the show, and let's just start right there. How much did the Civil War cost us in records? I would say a huge amount. The difference between researching my mother's southern ancestors and my father's northern ancestors is kind of night and day when you juxtapose the same decades. Uh, So many burned counties and things kind of scattered to the wind after the Civil War in the South, and so it led to loss and destruction of other records, too. Sure. I'm sure that's true. What about courthouses? I mean, we always hear about burnt courthouses, and I think they're more prominent in the South. What percentage of them do you think were actually lost? Oh, I'm not sure I could rattle off a specific number, but this is my very unscientific guess. But it seems kind of like one in every three courthouses that I look into has had some kind of destruction. And, you know, I keep reading on the Family Search Wiki or wherever I'm looking, and it says in 1864, especially in Virginia, I found that to be true. And mm. so there's just this devastating loss of records from, you know, 1600s and 1700s Virginia, where so many people's ancestors came from, even if, you know, they left there in 1710. But, you know, you can't pick that up. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's just gone. And was this all mm-hmm. tied into uh, General Sherman's march down? to Atlanta and to the sea? Not in every case. I've seen a lot where, a lot of cases where, uh, again, especially in Virginia, where there was conflict uh, towards the end of the Civil War. And I think with some Union soldiers kind of 
they would just destroy records, basically create some chaos to handicap the area that they were attacking at the time. And they uh, weren't all coordinated attacks by Sherman, is my understanding. But I think he definitely gets the blame for most of them down south. <laughs> yeah, there were definitely some uh, rogue soldiers off doing mm -hmm. other things. So uh, what substitute records are there for some of these things? Obviously, some of them were not replaceable, but there have to be some substitutes for some of them. Right. In rare cases, I've seen where county clerks may have collected the surviving records and kind of collated them into a substitute book. But that's, you know, best case scenario. In other cases, I found the doing research in the closest non-burned county can sometimes help you because, you know, you may own land in one county, live in another, but your transactions will be recorded elsewhere. And so you may find an ancestor doing business in the county where he never appears on a census or tax list, for example. And then statewide and federal records are obviously also a good resource because, you know, if county XYZ lost everything in the Civil War, that wouldn't have affected records kept on the state level. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then let's move on then to the next big thing that obviously ties back to the whole crux of the Civil War, the plantation right. records and the records concerning slavery. What survives mm -hmm. there? I would say a pretty substantial amount because a lot of those were kept kind of the opposite of state level. They were kept on a family level, uh, private collections, um, small business communities uh, in the uh, pre-Civil War South. One really great collection that comes to mind is uh, it was Camden County, Georgia, the southeasternmost county in the state which borders Florida. It's a collection of affidavits from slave owners who were bringing slaves from Florida north into Georgia. Basically, they had to swear that they were importing the slaves just to do work on their property in Camden County and were not bringing them across state lines to sell them and make a profit, which is very tragic. But genealogically speaking, it's an incredible resource because the enslavers had to list off every single one of the enslaved people that they were bringing into the state with ages, sometimes personal descriptions, sometimes family connections. So for those of us looking for people whose ancestors might have been one of these enslaved people brought across the state line, you might find a complete listing of their family unit along with some personal details that you know, you'd never find. And some of these records go back to the 1820s when they're never going to appear in a census because they may have died before emancipation. So sure. Uh, also, university archives sometimes may have gathered together like private family collections from plantations, and those will have letters and bills of sale and all things where you never know if you're going to find that one line that has your specific ancestor in it. So those are very exciting. It's true. You know, you hear from people who make discoveries every day if they're dealing with something from the north. But those people who find something in the south, they really have something to celebrate, don't they? Because it's really oh, hard yes. to, to find so many of these things. And we really need to spend a little time, too, on the Freedmen Bureau records. Mm -hmm. And and this was set up by the United States government uh, actually following emancipation to help those freed enslaved individuals to set up their lives, to have a bank and uh, Family Search has done an amazing job with these. Right. Yeah, I found that they're kind of hit or miss in the sense that there's not a huge quantity of individuals represented in the collection from what I found. And now that there's a much more comprehensive index available, maybe I should go back and research some of these <laughs> names that I've looked for before. But I think it was about two or three weeks ago, I found uh, one man that I was researching I searched his name on the index, just kind of a shot in the dark, found something and thought, that's a very specific, unusual name. And it was actually his brother that I didn't know existed, an application with the Freedmen's Bureau, where he had to not only give his name, his age, birthplace, he had to give his parents' names. And he also, there's a note when they died and where they died, as well as his siblings and where they live now or the last time he had contact with them. Wow. And so, I learned that I think there were eight siblings, and I had reached a brick wall with this man, and suddenly with one record found his parents and I would assume all of his siblings. And there were notes about um, one that really sticks out to me. It was a sister named Mary, and it said, sold nine years ago, last heard from in Charleston. Oh. And this is a family in Georgia, and I was never able to find her in other records so far, but it just kind of shows – those were things that they had to deal with and 
that's something I never would have found from any other record. No, that's right. Wow. You must have just been going to sleep smiling that night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's huge. And for people who want to look at the Freedmen Bureau records, most of them have been digitized and or indexed on FamilySearch.org. And you can look at all kinds of stuff there. So there's a Freedmen Bureau, Records of Freedmen from 1865 to 1872. There's the Freedmen Bureau claim records. There's the labor contracts, indenture, and apprenticeship records. Most of them go from like 1865 to 1872. Some go from 1861. That's the Freedmen Bureau marriages record. That goes up to 1872. They got hospital and medical records. They've got uh, persons and articles hired uh, from 1865 to 72. It was huge. And that's just dipping your toe in the water there. So they're getting indexed more and more all the time, but most all of them have been digitized, and you can find them on FamilySearch.org. Just do a, a search at Family Search and put in Freedmen Bureau, and it'll take you right up, especially their wiki page. It'll map the whole thing out for you. So, Robert, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. The South is a really a challenging thing for any researcher, and <laughs> you've certainly uh, outlined at least some of the problems and maybe hopefully a few of the solutions as well. Hopefully. All right. Thanks for talking to us. He's Robert Cushing. He's a DNA specialist over at Legacy Tree Genealogists, but he lives right down there at Athens, Georgia, not far from Atlanta and certainly at the heart of the end of the Civil War and does a lot of Southern research on his own. Talk to you again sometime in the future, Robert. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Great stuff, as always, from our sponsors at Legacy Tree Genealogists. And coming up next, David Allen Lambert rejoins me for another round of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. All right, genies, the masks are off, libraries and archives are opening up, and in part because of the pandemic, there are more records online than ever before. That means more opportunities for you to discover your ancestors and piece together their stories. Hey, it's Fisher, and if you haven't joined the official Extreme Genes Facebook group, Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies, there's never been a better time. Here's your chance to visit online with like-minded genies. This is the place for exchanging ideas on new sources, databases, DNA, and, well, strategies. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies got a whole bunch of genies through the pandemic and will only be better now that things are opening up. It's a great online community that gets better still when you become a part of it. Remember, sometimes it only takes one tip or idea to get your family research where you want it to go. Since it costs you nothing to sign up, why not join us? Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. Anytime is a great time to learn more about your family. Did you miss Roots Tech Connect this year? It's not too late to experience Roots Tech classes, keynotes, and how-to content. Just visit RootsTech.org to see what you missed and to experience Roots Tech Connect on your own timetable. Select inspiring and insightful messages that will help you in your pursuit to connect with and share your family story in new ways. You can then use the free resources found at Family FamilySearch.org or the Family Search Family Tree app to have a deeper personal experience getting to know your family, past and present. Connecting with family and learning about your ancestors provides healing, peace, and a sense of belonging. And it's easy to share what you learn with others to help and inspire them as well. Visit RootsTech.org for some inspiration or visit FamilySearch.org to continue on your journey of family discovery today. Hey Genies, it's Fisher here, and my shiny new ExtremeGenes.com website has been described as having that new car smell. I love hearing that. Having been with you for over eight years now, it felt like time to help out listeners and followers who need to know the basics of genealogical research, as well as how to understand your DNA test results, and to be able to put them to work for you breaking down brick walls, identifying birth parents, locating new cousins who may have photos and information that can't be found anywhere else, and verifying your paper trails. Yes, DNA can do all that, and I can show you how. Check out the all-new ExtremeGenes.com website and download the free Genealogy Strategy Roadmap and the free DNA Starter Guide. Then if you like what you see, you can take those next steps to sign up for the video courses that you can watch at your leisure. 
I'll take you through all the basics, step by step. Find out more now at ExtremeGenes.com. All right, we're back for Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. David Allen Lambert is back from AmericanAncestors.org. And, uh, David, we have a question here from Rich Michaels in Frederick, Maryland. And he says, guys, my great aunt left us a huge chart we found in her attic that took our family tree back to British royalty and Ah. then back to Adam and Eve. That goes how, back a little way. Yeah. How reliable should we consider this chart? Thanks, Rich. Well, Rich, I mean, the first thing to do is to establish if you have, as we call a gateway ancestor, as in a gateway to a royal line. And there's so many different things out there on the Internet. You just have to be a little cautious. But even years ago, people would sell you whatever you wanted to place on paper as your line. So first thing, I would look at Gary Boyd Roberts' royal descents of 900 immigrants, and that will help you establish maybe if your immigrant ancestor or gateway ancestor has a royal line. A lot of people go back to Edward I. I have a couple. I'm sure you do too, Fish. Yep. And the thing about it is going beyond that. So English royalty can go back to at least the 5th century. King Surtic of Wessex of the West Saxons, and he flourished around um, the 6th century. And so that's good, but there are other lines that can go back farther. In fact, uh, genealogists by the name of Don Stone and others have found lines that bring Edward I back to Ptolemy, uh, who was a pharaoh Mm. in ancient Egypt, the same era of Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. But you got to remember that a lot of these things are oral traditions that have been passed down. It sure. could have been by storytellers. But, I mean, our genealogy is as good as it is on paper because I don't know of any DNA test that's going to help you solve <laughs> if your chart is 100%. But if you get an answer that proves it, let us know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the thing about this is this never allows for illegitimacy. It never allows for a missing generation, say, in the biblical record, because a lot of Mm -hmm. these things are said to go back to that time. The other thing is, is if a king tells me as the court genealogist that I am to go back and take his family all the way back to Adam, you can be darn sure I'm going to come back and bring that king exactly what he wants, a line back to Adam and Eve. Or you can be certain he'll present your head on a platter yes, for you. Yes, that kind of exactly. thing. Exactly. So uh, keep in mind, like you said, David, if it's on paper, that's great. And if there's actually some record of that somewhere, that's great. But uh, no, I, I wouldn't believe anything I see related to Adam and Eve as being an accurate chart. Right. And like I say, just when you look at genealogy and just remember that you have to go back generation by generation in recent years and fact check. If you can't find any document that connects you, you know, past the sixth century, because, well, there's no document, it's a theory, the rest of it is still kind of chalked up as plausible. So Yeah. Maybe you can never prove this, but there there sure mm-hmm. is an easy way to disprove it, and that would be to just start going through the recent generations and try to find an error. That's true. <laughs> well, as they say, we're all descended from Charlemagne, yep. uh, at least they claim. So, I mean, there, there's a start right there. <laughs> and then you just have to go beyond that and go reverse. Absolutely. But it's a fascinating thing. You're not the only one out there that has this. In fact, my wife had one of these at one time when I first started out. I said, well, look at this. I mean, I was mm-hmm. skeptical of it, but uh, it, nonetheless, it was fascinating. And it certainly did prove to be a royal line. But the idea of going all the way back to Adam and Eve, yeah, I'm not so sure. So anyway, thanks for the note, Rich. That's that's a really good question. Now, I've run into that many times over the years. And really, everybody pretty much says, forget about it. No, nothing there. All right, we got another question coming up as we continue with round two of Ask Us Anything when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
All right, back for another round of Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show at ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with David Allen Lambert from AmericanAncestors.org, the New England Historic Genealogical Society. David, this is kind of a, a unique question here. It's from Amy in Monterey, California, and she mm-hmm. says, Dave and Fish, after World War II, my dad brought back a chunk of the Colosseum in Rome. It was in my, it was in my dad's footlocker in a box with a note identifying it. I feel a little uneasy having this. Is this a common thing? Should I return it, Amy? Uh, well, mm. I haven't been to the Colosseum, but I can tell you that I've seen a lot of stones that don't look like they're associated anymore. So returning it. Hell, it yeah. probably isn't like a puzzle piece where it can kind of fit in. Unless, of course, it's some really ornate piece that's yeah. uh, identifiable. <laughs> that That's fascinating. You know, I, I hate to say it. When I go over to Europe or northern New England and I go to a cellar hole or someplace my ancestor lived, I'm not going to rip a roof tile off or a brick from the building. But if I find something around the edge of the foundation for my own family's home, I, I might want to bring something back. I mean, if it's an archaeological site or someplace protected, I'd be a little careful because I wouldn't want to be breaking the law or end up in jail. No, um, no, of course not. And you don't want to basically desecrate an historic site. No, no, absolutely not. So I am presently holding, as you were speaking there, Dave, I grabbed this right off one of my shelves. I have a little shadow box with Mm -hmm. different rocks in it. One is a piece of brick fallen off a brick wall from my uh, ancestor who lived in the late 18th century in uh, northern Yorkshire. And then Mm -hmm. I have a fallen piece of arch from St. Bartholomew the Great Church in London where my immigrant ancestor couple got married in 1801. Now, there had been a portion of the roof that had fallen in and Mm -hmm. it was roped off. And so I asked the pastor there if he minded if I were to pick up a piece of this to take home and he gave me permission. So I Mm -hmm. have a guilt-free piece there. <laughs> and, and, and then the other was just a piece of stone from the parish church that, like you say, was just lying along the ground. And so these things are really nice little treasures, but they certainly don't cause any loss to these particular sites. So, you know, it is very common, obviously, depending on the individual, if they go and pick some of these things up. And, you know, one of the things that I do, and I've been a rock collector, you know, I'm genealogist slash geologist in training, and I picked up a rock that may have been from the town that my grandmother grew up or, you know, where my great, 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 great grandfather lived. Maybe don't know where the house was, but I know where the churchyard was or something like that. And I just pick up a piece of stone that may have been there when they were there. Yeah. You know? It's funny you mentioned this. I had just worked on a history of my mother's mother's family, and it made a mm-hmm. reference in there that my great-grandfather Otto Spute was back in Sweden in 1930, and he went and visited the location of the home that he was born in. And the, the house was no longer there, but there was some material around the foundation, and he picked up some rocks and stuck them in his pocket. And so this is right mm-hmm. around 1930. So, you know, even our ancestors collected these little remnants that tie back into their past. Oh, that's true. I mean, if, even if you look into like the Civil War, I mean, soldiers would pick up something from the battlefield that yes. they were in, even if it wasn't historically tied in, but within their own lifetime. So what your dad did is not bad. And I'm sure that the Colosseum will not fall down because of that small piece. <laughs> I don't condone people going there now and taking a piece home because they heard it on Extreme Genes. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy, for the question. Thank you, Dave, for helping with the answer. And if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, you can always email us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. Well, that is our show for this week. Thanks for joining us. If you missed any of it, of course, catch the podcast on iTunes, extremegenes.com, iHeartRadio, Spotify. I mean, you name it, we're all over the place. And by the way, check out the freebies available for you right now to learn more about how to do genealogy and understand DNA on our brand new website, extremegenes.com. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 